online design of his publications. So, at the moment, he's Emeritus Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy, Fellow of Christ College, Christ College, Cambridge. And among his outstanding publications, as you know, the Hellenistic Philosophers with uh, Anthony Long, uh, Lucretius and the Transformation of Greek Wisdom, uh, and as an editor, the Cambridge Companion to Greek and Roman Philosophy, and as uh, he was in charge of Plato's Craticus. And then we have the midwife of Platonist texts and subtexts in Plato's Theaetetus. And then we have this important work on creationism and its critics in antiquity. Uh, <clears throat> he was also the editor with Iopolo of Pyrrhonists, Patricians, Platonizers, Hellenistic philosophy in the period 155, 86 before Christ. And then he was the editor with Andrea Nightingale of Ancient Models of Mind, Studies in Human and Divine Rationality. And with Alex Long, Plato, Mino, and Fido, as we know very well. And finally, he was the editor of the philosophy of Antiochus. But he has also been important in the edition of Papyri, as you know well. So we have, first thing, Epicurus on nature, book uh, seven, uh, 28, sorry. Um, then we have uh, the edition of some of the Oxford English Papyri, some of them with Bastianini, and um, then we have uh, various texts in Corpus Dei Papiri Philosophi Philosophici, Greci e Latini, and a Brazilian interpretation of Plato's De Tetus. So, I think we can start. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much. Maybe I'm too close to the microphone. Is this better? Is that? that more? How's that? Okay, I'll signal if, it, if I become normal. Thank you very much for your introduction, Beatrice. I'm very grateful to the um, IPS for the honor of this invitation. I think uh, I'm incredibly grateful to the uh, local organizers, especially Gabriele, for their absolutely wonderful hospitality and organization. Uh, I'm this, you, you have got a text in the big book of papers, a text of this um, lecture, but I'm also going to uh, give a kind of summary of it with PowerPoint as I go through. So you, you may, if you like, choose to follow the PowerPoint rather than your um, tablet or laptop. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm told that I'm told that if uh, I don't take too long over this lecture, they might, despite the tradition of not having. <laughs> yes, she has, she has ten dollars. I'm okay. No, I have to. I'm, I'm compelled to be in this post too. Um, I'm told that if I get through this fast enough, we may be allowed to a bit of question time after all. So, uh, the immortality of the soul is one of Plato's favorite topics. In a series of dialogues generally thought to span the greater part of his writing career, above all, Apology, Gorgias, Nino, Philo, Republic, Phaedrus, and Simeus, he reverts to it repeatedly, talking up no fewer than seven formal proofs of it. At the center of all this stands his ethically pivotal conviction that the soul outlives its present incarnation to be duly rewarded or punished. The realization that the soul's progressions and regressions are most properly evaluated and understood over an indefinitely long time span and not just within the confines of a single life, in, in his eyes, both makes greater moral sense of the world and clarifies how we can best play our own part in it. It also offers the longer term prospect of our souls leaving bodily incarnation behind. Besides, that our souls are such as to survive death 
goes to Hades and perhaps return in new incarnations was part of a religious tradition with roots of Homer and Orphism. Plato would for this reason see himself less as an innovator than as an interpreter and defender of these traditions. In the Phaedo, Socrates, awaiting execution, has the task of convincing his interlocutors that the soul is immortal, and thus clarifying why instead of fearing his imminent death, he looks forward to whatever rewards await him in the afterlife. The most astute of his interlocutors, Cebes, has expressed his concern that even a soul capable of surviving the body's dissolution might prove not to be altogether immortal but could eventually wear out and die. Socrates' long reply is intended to shut off this danger by showing the soul to be intrinsically immortal, the sort of thing that not only does not die, but in its very nature could not die. I want to examine the final part of this reply, 102 to 107, the last argument as it's come to be known in some detail. The argument has a reputation for being both difficult and unsatisfactory. As a result of this, a number of scholars have resorted to reading Plato and his speaker Socrates as themselves considering the argument mistaken or at any rate unreliable. But Plato created this argument and put it into Socrates' mouth precisely in order to explain why Socrates went confidently and cheerfully to his death. It seems to me scarcely credible that he should intend to convey the message that Socrates' final act as a philosophical martyr, his confident acceptance of death, was based on a faulty argument. In order to resist that unwelcome interpretation, however, one must attempt to show that Socrates' last argument is in fact a philosophically serious and skillful defense um, of the soul's immortality worthy both of him and of Plato, and any global interpretation of the dialogue is likely to be shaped by the outcome of that attempt. I don't, of course, mean by this that the argument is in fact successful, and I assume a further two and a half millennia of philosophy to have taught us that even if the soul were immortal, this fact would probably not admit a form of proof. But I think it is as good an argument for that conclusion as can be found in, in anywhere in the Platonic corpus, and that its supposed incoherences have been exaggerated. It is, in short, intended to serve as the definitive proof of the soul's total immunity to death. Socrates is not plausibly understood as himself being convinced by this argument for the first time only as he finishes expounding it. Rather, he is repeating for the benefit of CPs an argument that he has worked out for himself previously, at least in outline, thanks especially to his profound and hard-won understanding of causality, which has taken him really all his adult life. What is being explained is his accommodating attitude to death, not just at the moment when he drinks the hemlock, but throughout the preceding period of his trial and imprisonment. Let me then start with a minimalist sketch of the argument prefacing a warning that the precise way in which I shall divide his work between two stages is unorthodox. A, an introduction of a new metaphysical class, which we can call essential bearers. Fire is essentially hot and imports heat to whatever it occupies. Analogously, snow is an essential bearer of cold, three of oddness, fever of sickness, and the soul of life. On the approach of the opposite property, cold, fire can either retreat or perish. What it cannot do is stay and emit coldness, i.e. become cold fire. The same applies, mutatis mutandis, to the other essential bearers, soul included. So those, that's the uh, introduction of the class. Now its applications, stage one, the soul's immortality takes us down to 105E10. Since soul is essentially alive and imports life to whatever it occupies, on the approach of the opposite property, death, it cannot stay and admit death. Being thus incapable of becoming dead, soul is immortal. I've written there QED, order at them and This actually is the, uh, the conclusion. 
stage two, the soul's departure. Despite the close parallelism between the fire case and the soul case, there is one significant difference. Approached by the property that it cannot admit, fire has the twin options of retreating and perishing. In soul's case, however, the option of perishing is excluded, since for a soul to perish is the same thing as for it to admit death, precisely the property that it cannot admit. Therefore, on the approach of death, the soul is reduced to the one remaining option, that of retreating, and it does so, we are to suppose, by leaving the body and going to Hades. Two points need to be stressed at this stage. The first is that the soul of going to Hades, when death comes, has been central to Socrates' contentions from the start of the dialogue. So that stage two of the argument, as I've construed it here, is no trivial afterthought. The dialogue's very first argument for immortality, the so-called cyclical argument, was likewise a defense of the Hades mythology. According to certain religious traditions, Socrates there pointed out, the soul cycles between discarnate existence in Hades and incarnate existence here. His ensuing <coughs> argument was an attempt to vindicate this religious account of the soul's transformations by bringing it under a general scientific law. That is, all change between opposites, it turned out, is correspondingly cyclical. And since making the Hades tradition scientifically respectable has been one of Socrates' leading aims all along, it should be no surprise that the last argument ends on a reaffirmation of Hades. Naturally, as in fact Socrates has earlier hinted, the Hades motif <coughs> may need to be deliteralized so as to exclude some of the traditional trappings of the afterlife. But what Hades continues to represent is the soul's successful detachment from the body, its continued discarnate existence, and in most cases its eventual return to incarnation at a level matching its, its acquired degree of purity or impurity. The conclusion persuades Socrates to face death cheerfully is not simply that the soul is immortal, but that upon death, the soul unshackles itself from its current body and embarks upon whatever progression it has earned. Hence, stage two of the argument, which I shall argue to consist in the demonstration that upon the approach of death, the soul retreats, is absolutely pivotal to the dialogue's conclusions. It is no accident at all that this final stage of the argument concludes with the words, then see these, it is definitely the case that soul is something immortal and imperishable, and that our own souls really will exist in Hades. That ending not only captures Socrates' intended emphasis, but also directly leads into his concluding myth, in which he conjectures what the real nature of Hades must be like. The second vital point is one I've already indirectly raised. <coughs> The last argument, just like the cyclical argument, is an attempt to make a religious tradition scientifically respectable. The cyclical argument did this by showing that the cyclical transformations of the soul were no exception to a general scientific law of change, equally applicable to moral, mathematical, and biological processes. Similarly, the last argument aims to show that the basic laws it is applying to the soul such as the ones about retreating or perishing, are applicable right across the board, for example, to phys physical stuffs like fire and snow, to mathematical entities like numbers, and to biological occurrences like sickness. The reason for this strategy should be clear. If Socrates had limited himself to the analogy between fire and soul, as highlighted in the minimalist sketch that I, um, I've already offered, he would have faced the natural objection that fire and soul belong to two radically different ontological realms, the one physical, the other immaterial and noetic, a distinction already emphasized by Socrates himself in the affinity argument. In that case, the objection would run, no one need feel obliged to accept that fire and soul obey the same laws. Indeed, the fact that the soul is by Socrates' own admission ontologically unique akin to forms rather than to sensible things, but not itself a form either, 
would suggest that no possible analogy between the soul and anything else could be provocative. It's for this reason that Socrates' inductive argument sets out to cover as wide and heterogeneous a range of examples as possible. By doing so, he seeks to show that, like his earlier law of change, the current set of laws are of universal applicability and do not depend on the specific ontological status of the item under consideration. Hence, even something as ontologically sui generis as the soul must be assumed to conform to them. The wide variety of examples over which Socrates generalizes thus makes excellent strategic sense. But it is also what has generated most of the bewilderment experienced by interpreters. Socrates has previously, in his so-called second voyage, argued that the safest way to identify the cause of something's being, for example, beautiful, is to point to beauty as the cause. If instead we name, say, a thing's shape or color as the cause of its being beautiful, we will never get fully consistent results. The same shape or color will be, will in numerous cases, contribute just as effectively to something's being ugly. But if we stick to saying that it is beauty that makes them beautiful, largeness that makes them large, and so on, we cannot possibly go wrong. Such formal causes are therefore utterly safe, to use a Socrates' term. But relying on them is also, as he puts it, simple-minded, in that they are close to being tautologies. The fulcrum of the last argument is the proposal of a new set of items, what I'm more of calling essential bearers, which combine the safeness of formal causes with the informativeness of the Aristian kind of explanation exemplified by naming a thing's shape or color as the cause of its being beautiful. <coughs> because of this informativeness, they're called more subtle instead of simple-minded. If, for example, we say that the presence of fire in something makes it hot, that is genuinely informative about what is causing it to be hot, but still safe in the fire, being itself essentially and inalienably hot, could never by its presence make something cold, in the way that the same shape or color that contributes to one thing's being beautiful could contribute to another's being ugly. To say that fire makes things hot is thus safe, in the same sense of safe, i.e. self-guaranteeing and immune to in incoherence, in which it's also safe to say that heat makes things hot. Just as fire is an essential bearer of heat, so too snow is an essential bearer of cold, the number three of numerical oddness, and fever of sickness. Last and most important, soul is an essential bearer of life. Whether the presence of one of these items is a sufficient condition of its effects occurring, a necessary condition, or both, is not made specific. It seems clear, however, that all are in fact sufficient conditions, and that this is a part of what it means to say a certain item brings this or that property to whatever it occupies. Moreover, some of them, for example, snow as bearer of cold, three as bearer of oddness, cannot possibly be necessary conditions. Your feet can be cold without standing in snow, and the number of people in this room can be odd without being either three or for that matter, a thousand and three. Nevertheless, it may well be a necessary condition for some appropriate bearer be present. For example, if not three, then another appropriately defined number. And it does become clear from the text that Plato shared the widespread assumptions that the presence of fire is a necessary condition of a thing's being hot. That seems to be said at 105 B to C, and it's also his doctrine in Timaeus 62a. And the presence of soul, likewise, a necessary condition of something's being alive. What matters for the success of the argument, nevertheless, is that the items should be sufficient conditions, provided only, provided only that soul's presence in it is sufficient to make something alive. Soul is an essential bearer of life. At this stage, it's vital to insist also on the point that the essential bearers are particulars. Many scholars have supposed that at least some of the items in the class of essential bearers, perhaps even all of them, are transcendent forms. This, it seems to me, could not possibly be right. 
falls, as Socrates has emphasized earlier in the dialogue, cannot perish. Whereas the main point of working through the examples of essential bearers is to illustrate systematically how these items have the alternative option of retreating and perishing. The essential bearers are precisely not separated forms, those safe, if simple-minded, remote causal principles, but a distinct range of imminent entities capable of occupying or withdrawing from individual things and thus causing them to partake or cease to partake in essential properties that they themselves possess. The main reason why comparatively few interpreters have followed this obvious line seems to be that one of the essential bearers, the number three, which by its presence brings oddness, is one specifically referred to as the form of three, hair, tone, trione, idea, under four D. But elsewhere in the passage, Socrates makes it quite clear that he's talking about imminent tripleness, the specific tripleness of this or that trio of things, rather than the form of three, because the tripleness in question is re repeatedly described as capable of perishing. 104C, 105E to 106A, and 106C. The natural solution then, as some have seen, for example, Christopher Rowe, is to take idea as meaning not a transcendent form, but a character in a metaphysically less restricted sense. This suggestion is borne out by the fact that idea has nowhere hitherto in the Phaedo or in any dialogue likely to predate it, been used as a term for a transcendent form. Its use in that sense is in fact unexpectedly rare in Plato and might almost have gone unnoticed, but for the famous pair of references to the Idea to Agathu, the form of the good in the Republic, and for Aristotle's frequent use of high Idea as his own way of referring to Platonic forms, a precedent which has led to its often being known as Plato's theory of ideas. The further reason why some have doubted that any essential errors can be particulars has been that Plato is committed to the compresence of opposites in particulars for any predicate F that has an opposite G. Whatever particular is F is also in some way G. If so, the number three, were it to be understood as a particular, namely imminent tripleness, would have to be even as well as odd. Fire would have to be cold as well as hot, and so on, and that would conflict with the assumptions underlying the argument, according to which an essential bearer cannot take on the opposite of the property it bears. In reply to this objection, it should be sufficient to observe that the compresence of opposites is a principle endorsed by Socrates in the last argument, but only for cases where the subject bears the relevant predicates contingently or relatively, in the way that Simeas bears both of the predicates large and small, despite not being essentially either one or the other, as explained at 102 C to D. There was never any suggestion in the Phaedo or elsewhere that all properties of particulars, including essential properties, are compresent with their own opposites, um, or, or negations. And there's therefore no reason to be surprised that a particular case of tripleness should have oddness without the compresence of evenness, or a particular flame be hot and not also cold. I now return to the argument. The principles affecting all these essential bearers are fair, fairly formally set out by Socrates. I'll illustrate um, each principle with an example, this time an example of snow. In every case where some item X is the essential bearer of some property, Fness, whose opposite we will call genes, the following seven principles obtain. Principle one, X is not the same thing as Fness, for example, snow is not the same thing as coldness. Principle two, X, so long as it exists, is F. For example, snow, so long as it exists, is cold. Three, X will never, while being X, emit genus. Thus, snow will never, so long as it is snow, emit heat. <coughs> Principle four, rather, upon the approach of genus, X will either retreat or perish. Thus, rather, than, rather upon the approach of heat, snow will either retreat or stay and be melted. 
Fine, X is not an opposite, but is permanently in possession of one, namely F minus. Thus, snow itself has no opposite. But its essential property, coldness, is an opposite, namely the opposite of heat. Six, X always imports its own character and F minus to whatever it occupies. Snow makes anything it occupies both snowy and cold. And finally, seven, X is properly called g -less. This is a, a, a difficult to translate from the Greek. It's called, uh, for example, that's to say X is properly described as incapable of g -less. For example, snow should be called heatless in the sense that it's incapable of becoming hot. I've said the principles aren't more or less in the order in which they're listed, but actually, Principle six is initially announced as the one that defines the class. And we may take it that it's already for this reason, if already for this reason constitutes a sufficient condition of something's being an essential bearer. For on Plato's cause of assumptions, the only way that some given item X could always import the same property, <coughs> Fness, to whatever it occupies, is by itself being essentially F. Given that, the other six principles follow easily enough from the defining principle six. All of Socrates' examples can be fitted to the same analysis as snow, but with varying degrees of clarity. The vital retreat or perish principle, principle four, is most readily intelligible for, for, for snow and fire. For example, snow must literally retreat, that is, be distanced from heat, if it's not going to perish, i.e. melt. This provides the model that Plato needs for the eventual case of the soul, which on the approach of death must spatially depart from the body and travel to Hades. A little strain begins to show, on the other hand, in cases where the, the retreating is not a literal spatial distancing. Consider fever. Fever is an essential bearer of sickness, and whatever body it occupies is itself made to be sick. What would it mean to say that on the advance of health, the opposite of sickness, the fever must either retreat or perish? Presumably, it means that, that the fever must either abate with a possibility of relapse, that's what it is for the fever to retreat, or be altogether cured, which is for the fever to perish. Retreating this time means something less obviously locomotive and more to do with becoming inactive. And some such deliteralization will be required, it seems, in all the other cases considered. Take oddness. Oddness belongs primarily to the numbers, number series three, five, seven, and so on. It's thanks to the presence of one of these numbers in a set of things, for example, in the set of chairs in this room, that that set also becomes numerically odd. On the approach of evenness, if, for instance, I try to make the number of chairs even by subtracting one, the existing number cannot stay and become an even number, but must either retreat or perish, meaning what this time? Perhaps that if I remove a chair that I could later put back, the original odd number has retreated, whereas if I burn the chair, that number has perished. No doubt other interpretations could be devised, but I doubt if any can avoid taking retreat in such a case to mean something like become inactive or cease to be operative and not to designate spatial distancing. It should be emphasized at this point that the options of retreating and perishing were first introduced by Socrates at the start of the last argument with an example which cannot itself count as an example of an essential bearer. And there, too, retreat had to be understood along non-spatial lines. The case chosen was Simias's own particular largeness, what's called the largeness in him. When he stands next to Socrates, who is smaller than him, his largeness advances. When he stands next to Phaedo, who is larger than him, it retreats again. Largeness is, for Plato, based on evidence outside of the Phaedo, definable as the capacity to exceed. So Simeas's own largeness will be his own particular <coughs> capacity to, to exceed others, which is determined by his particular height, 
let's say, six feet. Presumably, for Simeas, his particular largeness to perish would be for him actually to change height. While it's retreating, consists in his ceasing to use his own particular capacity to exceed without actually losing that particular capacity. Clearly, in a case like imminent largeness, retreat cannot be purely or even primarily a locomotive term. Yet the retreating that soul will be shown to do on the approach of death could not, without serious damage to Socrates' overall intentions, be equated with soul to become inactive. It has to indicate the soul's departure to another place, outside its present body. The soul's retreating, in other words, has to be more closely analogous to the literally spatial retreating of snow or fire than to the non-spatial retreating of the number three, or of imminent largeness. What we are witnessing is not a confusion on Plato's part, I think, but a perhaps inevitable strain imposed by devising principles for application over a comprehensive explanatory range. Nevertheless, I think a common core of meaning can be discerned. All of the retreating items are being considered in their capacity as importing, uh, as importing their essential property to that which they occupy. And these notions themselves imply something like local presence. Maybe we can't always give the precise spatial coordinates of your state of health, your tallness, the number of visible planets, or the fire that ancient physics typically presumes to make a piece of iron hot by being present in it. But that does not mean that they don't have spatial locations. Your state of health and your tallness are in you and are therefore right now in this room. Likewise, the number of visible planets it is in the solar system or in the sky, and the fire probably has precisely the same spatial coordinates as the iron it occupies. If these items were said to retreat from their locations, the primary meaning would be that they temporarily ceased to import their essential property to the things in question. In some cases, the natural way for them to do that would be to depart spatially from the occupied entity as the fire might be expected to do from the iron. And as, uh, on at least a possible understanding of disease, your illness could be thought to do from you. In other cases, they might rather be presumed to stay, but to go out of use, as your tallness does when you're not actively overtopping somebody, and as the number of visible planets does when one of them goes below the horizon. In all cases, the common core meaning of retreat is that the essential bearer, while continuing to exist, ceases actively to occupy its host and to import its essential property to it. In the case of soul, then, its retreat will consist in its continuing to exist, but ceasing actively to occupy and animate the body it has occupied and animated up to now. In the context of Greek thought, especially given that death was earlier in the dialogue defined as the soul's separation from the body, it was entirely natural to interpret the soul's retreat as its literal departure from the body. To reformulate the same interpretation in the light of an earlier point, the assumption that the soul's retreat from the body it has animated is to be understood as a spatial departure to another world enjoyed the weight of authority that religious belief had already conferred on it. In showing that, by thus departing for Hades, the soul is conforming to a universal retreat or perish principle, Socrates' argument is conferring scientific respectability on that existing tradition, not seeking to prove its content true ab initio. I'll now proceed to the crucial final moves of the argument. Of the seven principles that Socrates has established for essential bearers, all are clearly meant to be applicable to soul, although only three are actually invoked in the closing moves of the argument, which I call stage one. That stage runs as follows. 105C to D, soul is the essential bearer of life. It always imports life to whatever it occupies, principle six. Just as snow by its presence makes things heavy, 
sorry, it makes things both snowy and cold, so too, Plato must mean, soul by its presence makes things both in souls and alive. However, it's only on the latter predicate, alive, that Socrates focuses. Since soul is the essential bearer of life, by principle three, soul is incapable of admitting the opposite property, death, an incapacity which Socrates explains with an explicit comparison to the way in which the number three is incapable of evenness. This now leads him directly to his key move based on principle seven. Back at 100 B9, Socrates undertook to prove that the soul is something deathless or immortal, that is in Greek, arthanaton her psyche. And that is precisely what he now claims to have done. So I read the key bit of text from 105 E2. Well now, what do we call that which does not admit death? The answer is arthanaton, deathless or immortal, by principle seven. Does soul not admit death? No. Then soul is something arthanaton, deathless or immortal. Yet it is something deathless or immortal. And now look at this line. Well now, said Socrates, are we to say that this has been proved? What do you think? That is apodidechai. Yes, and most sufficiently, Malaga Hikonos, Socrates. This is flagged up as clearly as one could reasonably ask as concluding the proof of the soul's immortality. Yet it is hard to find an interpreter who recognizes it as the conclusion. Why should this be so? It is because a further argument follows what I've labeled stage two, in which an additional inference is made from the soul's being arthanaton to its being anolithron, indestructible. And that further move is assumed to be an integral final step designed to show that soul is deathless, not merely in some innocuous or irrelevant sense, but in a sense appropriate to ground the conclusion that it is immortal. That is, it's thought that showing the soul to be arthanaton, deathless, is merely the intermediate step of showing that, that the expression dead soul is as much a contradiction in terms as cold fire or even trio would be, and that a vital move has yet to be made from that simple truth on which everybody might agree to the soul's actual imperishability. The trouble is that what follows makes a very poor case for any such additional development <coughs> beyond the initial conclusion. For the actual step from arthanaton to imperishable is, when it finally comes, accomplished in a few lines with an argument which seems at best only half serious, coupled with a comment that it's totally uncontroversial anyway. So I read, uh, but this doesn't need argument, says Socrates, because it could hardly be the case that anything else did not admit of destruction if that which is arthanaton, despite being everlasting, so that, that's not Socrates, that's um, that's um, Cebes, despite being everlasting, is going to admit of destruction. And everybody, I think, said Socrates, would agree that God and the actual form of life and anything else that is our thanaton never perishes. Yes, he said, all men would agree the point, and the gods even more so. The preceding very tightly worded argument has at this point been replaced by comparatively relaxed banter precisely because the specific point is trivially true and is not in dispute, but merely needs asserting for completeness. Of course, whatever is immortal is imperishable too, they're saying, try asking any god. More significant still, Seabees, in the first remark that I've just quoted, treats it as already known and agreed that what is immortal is our idiom, everlasting which shows that he's already understood Arthanaton as meaning immortal in the familiar sense. No, the motive for adding stage two of the argument has nothing to do with proving the soul immortal. That has already been accomplished in stage one. The purpose of stage two, as I foreshadowed in my opening summary, is to establish the further vital conclusion that the soul, when death approaches, must retreat, that is, leave the body and go to Hades. The argument, moreover, is very straightforward. 
Its point of departure is principles three and four. <coughs> if X, that is, if X is the essential bearer of Fness, X will never, while being X, admit genus, but upon the approach of genus will either retreat or perish. Or translated into the terms of the present case, a soul, being the essential bearer of life, will never, while being a soul, admit death, but upon the approach of death will either retreat or perish. However, Socrates points out, in this one special case, the option of perishing is unavailable. Why? Because trivially and uncontroversially, as I've said, anything that is our thanaton, deathless or immortal, is also imperishable. That is, for living things, death is the only possible way of perishing, so that if they cannot die, they cannot perish either. Hence, unlike all the essential bearers considered previously, the soul cannot perish when the opposite of its essential property approaches and is reduced to the single remaining option, that of retreating. Snow can melt on the approach of heat and fire be extinguished on the approach of cold. In both cases, this perishing is something they can do instead of staying and becoming respectively hot snow and cold fire. In the case of soul, there's no equivalent option. Soul can't perish because for it to do so would be for it to die, i.e. to do the impossible thing of staying and taking on the property dead, the opposite property to the one it essentially bears. Hence, uniquely in the case of soul, perishing is an unavailable option, and this leaves it when death approaches with no alternative but to retreat, or, in other words, to go to Hades. Recognizing stage two as added in order to secure a partly separate conclusion concerning the soul's departure to Hades enables us to return to the inference that concludes stage one and assess it for what it is, the culmination of the immortality argument. However, it will turn out that the added stretch of argument in stage two about the soul's departure to Hades retrospectively spells out some of the reasoning already tacitly underpinning the main conclusion in stage one. Hence, we can use that to throw light on exactly what the reasoning was in stage one. The vital retrospective sentence from stage two is 106b2 to four, which I read. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, it's, I'll read from just before it. If the immortal or deathless is also imperishable, it's impossible for soul, whenever death attacks it, to perish. For what, here, this is a bit like showing in the PowerPoint, for what we have said before shows that a soul won't commit <coughs> death and won't be dead. That is, the eternally prolonged future existence of the soul is guaranteed by the fact that were it to pass out of existence, it would thereby become that contradiction in terms, a dead soul. For a soul to die, and thereby become dead, is as impossible as for three to come to be an even number, or for snow to become hot snow. One famous objection, voiced originally by Strato Lampsicus, runs, just as fire is uncoolable for as long as it exists, perhaps so too the soul is deathless for as long as it exists. Strato's point is the following one. Principle three tells us only that soul is necessarily alive as long as it exists, i.e. that there's no such thing as a dead soul, but that does not show that a soul always exists. This objection and variants of it have enjoyed success among modern critics too. But just how damaging is the objection to the stage one argument? Suppose a soul were to cease to exist, that is, to perish, Given the scarcely deniable premises that for a living thing to perish entails its dying, and that what has died is thereafter dead, it may well seem that a soul that ceased to exist would ipso facto become dead. And this, a soul's being dead, is exactly the impossibility that Socrates has argued to follow from the supposition that a soul is capable of ceasing to exist. A little more formally, Socrates' argument can be expanded as shown in the PowerPoint. For a living thing <coughs> to cease to exist is the same as it, for it to die. If anything dies, it is thereafter dead. A soul is a living thing. Therefore, if a soul ceases to exist, it is thereafter dead. 
But it's impossible that something sh should be a dead soul, therefore a soul cannot cease to exist, i.e. die. Strato's tentatively worded objection implicitly focuses on step four, the allegedly impossible consequence arises, he means, only if we legitimately assume that the deceased soul still, it still exists to serve as the subject of the predicate dead. But is he right? If Plato has died, it follows that Plato is dead, with no necessary implication that Plato must still exist in order to bear the predicate dead. Similarly then, supposing Plato's soul to have died, it must now be dead, again with no illegitimate assumption of its continued existence to enable it to bear the predicate. Even non-existent subjects are obliged to obey the laws of logic. For James Bond to be a married bachelor remains equally self-contradictory whether or not he exists. Admittedly, there is implicit in the move from four, step four to step five a further inference to be made. That is an inference from Plato's soul is dead to Plato's soul is a dead soul. The two formulations may look interentailing or equivalent, but it's open to a supporter of Strato to argue that they're importantly different, uh, and that only the latter contains a genuine contradiction. Whether entailments of this form are sound seems to me a tricky question. I'm just going to sketch some musings of, about um, the difficulty of deciding whether Plato's right or not. Consider the following two models. Model one, uh, Plato was a philosopher. Plato has died. Plato is in perpetuity dead. Therefore, Plato is in perpetuity a dead philosopher. Model one yields in that last step a correct conclusion. Model two, Plato's body was a body. Plato's body has died. Plato's body is in perpetuity dead. That's all fine. But can we get from that Plato's body is in perpetuity a dead body? Model one yields in its fi um, final step a correct conclusion. Model two's correct conclusion is found at the in the third line. Uh, and um, the final step Plato's body is in perpetuity a dead body, is a false further inference. Now consider the parallel case of Plato's soul. Plato's soul was a soul. Assume that Plato's soul has died. If so, Plato's soul is in perpetuity dead, in which case Plato's soul is in perpetuity a dead soul. But nothing can be a dead soul, therefore Plato's soul has not died. To which of the two models should we assimilate this? If we follow model one, we do indeed reach the conclusion at 3D, as I've labeled it, Plato's soul is in perpetuity a dead soul, where a dead soul represents precisely the impossibility on which the last argument trades. Hence, on model one, it may well appear that Plato's soul cannot be dead, and therefore cannot have died. If, on the other hand, we were to adopt model two, we could infer nothing beyond what I've labeled um, set 3C um, in, the place, in this up version. Um, Plato's soul is in perpetuity dead. If the latter model is the more apposite one, perhaps Plato's soul may be dead without also being that contradiction in terms, a dead soul. Similarly, the fire that was previously burning in the grate may now said to be cold, without thereby being that contradiction in terms, a cold fire. I suspect that to insist on model two is the most promising way to undermine Plato's defense um, of immortality. But showing model one to be in apposite could in itself prove to be a demanding task. We should therefore remain impressed by the power of Plato's argument my aim in this lecture has not been to vindicate the Philo's final immortality argument as demonstrative. My, um, it's been to show that the argument is plausible enough to permit the assumption that Plato intended it seriously, both as a worthy culmination to his proofs of the soul's immortality and as the basis on which Socrates went confidently to his own death. Thank you.
and Professor Sedley, we have time for about 10 minutes. <coughs> Please. Kepi's his original objection is uh, you, ha you haven't yet shown us that the soul doesn't perish. And so like way back in 69E to 70A, he wants to be shown that the soul doesn't perish. And similarly, right before the, the affinity argument, we seem to repeat a desire to be shown that the soul doesn't perish. And so if you're right that we've shown immortality at stage one, is that what we wanted to be shown ultimately anyway? Did we want to be shown that the soul doesn't perish? So don't we need stage two to be shown what we wanted to be shown in the first place? I think that throughout the Fido, the, soul, the soul's dying and the soul's perishing are, are simply interchangeable. And he sometimes uses one, he sometimes uses the other, and he sometimes uses both together. If he really thought it mattered, to go from immortality to imperishability at the end of the final argument. He needed one more sentence, and that was all. Uh, so um, I don't think there is an important distinction there. And he does explicitly say, um, in introducing the final argument, he's going to prove the soul are found on that will be the conclusion. So uh, although I know there has, have been attempts to show that there's an important difference between indestructible and um, immortal, I, I really don't think the text of the, of the Fido confirms that. Tom Robinson. Thank you, David. That was very challenging. Um, I mean, a huge difficulty for me throughout all this is uh, what appear to be a couple of driving assumptions you know, uh, underlying this argument. One, we're expected simply assume the existence of soul to start with, and secondly, a definition of soul as being itself alive, it seems to make perfect sense, you know, from earlier arguments that soul might be described as a life principle, so that I am alive in terms of a life principle. It always strikes me as a strange oddity and a strange jump in the argument to say that the principle is a living thing, rather than being simply a principle of a different ontological. Uh, I mean, the notion of a principle is one that you've introduced, not one that he's introduced. Um, it, it's true that, I mean, I haven't focused, that, that does deserve discussing. Uh, it just happens that it, in English, dead soul is, is as contradictory an expression, despite there being a, a novel by Gogol that called Dead Souls, it is as contradictory an expression in English as it is in, in Greek, so it's been rather easy just to allow that bit through. But, because I think there are important problems about what the, nat what the function nature of the soul is, which a full analysis of this would, would have to address. So I, I can see your point. Thank you. Please go. Thank you. Um, I, one, I really appreciated this. One of, one of the concerns that you, that you address here is, is the objection that people have seemed to have that things like snow and three can't really retreat. Um, but when you were talking about it, you were talking about, well, someone could move the snow, like you could take your snow sculpture away from the fire and, and preserve it intact without it melting. And I was wondering if, again, the difference with soul is that it is self-moving. And so that the retreat does not involve somebody else moving it or adding another chair. This is, is this in, in addition to its imperishability, is this another sort of special property of soul as an example? That's a very useful addition. Um, by the way, I didn't, I didn't myself want to raise any problem about snow retreating, because re retreat means to, simply to move to another place, and that, there's no, no problem about saying it retreats by being carried. But you're, you're absolutely right that uh, n none of the other um, items in the list are self-movers. Uh, that soul is self-moving is, of course, eventually uh, Plato's doctrine, uh, 
certainly in the laws and uh, with qualifications, I'd say, in, in the FIDRAS as well. Uh, so that's rather, I don't want to say that therefore it's already below the surface present in the Fido, but the, the consideration you've just offered gives us a very good motive for Plato to, to come to that view at some point in his life. So thank you for the suggestion. I have two hands over there. Oh, okay. Hi. I have a... Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can I? It's a very quick... It's actually on this point. Uh, my hand is up. I'm kidding. <laughs> the, um, you, 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 you seem um, uh, committed to saying, well, producing a sense of retreat for all the cases, say retreat or, or perish seems to be an option, and both options should be available for most uh, bearers, although of course it turns out one of them is not available for the soul. But I wonder about that, you yourself admitted that you sort of had to come invent uh, a notion in which, uh, a way in which odd might retreat, and you said naturally we could come up possibly with other interpretations. And it seemed to me a, a bit, um, you know, not completely convincing, and I was wondering, you then appealed to the um, tallness in Simeus and the shortness in Simeus and so forth. And it's true that he introduces the notion of withdrawal there, but he doesn't really say that the tallness retreats. In fact, he says in a passage that you mentioned, a uh, uh, reference, Simeus has the name both small and large. It's not, it's not as if alternately. It's like, I, so I, I, I have a hard time thinking of the tallness retreating when you have the three of them in a line and that tallness somehow retreats at some point, or is inactive. I just wonder if you would explain that a little bit. Did, did you say, say you, you, he, he doesn't say that the tallness retreats? Yes. Um, well, um, so at least smallness does. And there's certainly, I, I have to check the text, but he certainly talks about either or both the tallness and smallness retreating or perishing. And uh, uh, it, it, it is a puzzle to me why he started out with the tallness and shortness examples in order to illustrate the notions of, of retreating and perishing, because although um, CB's takes the meaning to be obvious, most readers don't find it at all obvious. Whereas if he'd started with snow or fire, I don't think we would have a problem. We'd start with the, with the paradigmatic cases uh, where the snow has to get out of the way of the flame or it will melt, and, uh, and so on. Uh, if he started with those, that would have been fine. Why then does he start with tallness and shortness? Because that's what gives him the thematic link with the uh, second voyage passage, um, where, which is all about a largeness and smallness as, uh, as causes. Uh, so he's made a choice there, and it's a choice which I think causes a lot of the problems we have, which is why I myself have left tall the retreating of tallness, of largeness and smallness, uh, uh, to a fairly late stage of the analysis in order for it not to get in the way. And that, is, admittedly, is not, tr tr in terms of relative clarity, is not the way Plato sees it. Thank you, Professor Altman, please. Well, I'd like to challenge the fundamental thesis of your paper. Uh, and please forgive me for doing it, but as somebody, I don't think I'm the only person who sat through a lot of classes of Gregory Blastos that is going to... Yes. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, should I start again? Yes, just point it towards your mouth. Okay. Um, I want to challenge the fundamental thesis. I loved your explication of the argument, but the fundamental thesis. And in doing so, I, I speak just really almost in dialogue with a ghost of uh, Gregory Blastos, because I sat through his classes and many times here and say that there was an argument that was not compelling, but that we could be quite sure that Plato intended it to be so. Uh, so I want to look at a text that I think uh, indicates that Plato knows that the argument is inadequate uh, at 105C. The closest you came to it was you, when you mentioned the Timaeus uh, and you talked about fire. And this, of course, is the famous passage where he says that the monas is the cause of the oddness of a number. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that if, 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 if we take it uh, in your paper, when you talked about odd numbers, you appropriately began with three. Now, if we were going to follow Hippias the Sophist and think that one was an odd number, which of course we both know that it's not since you began with three, then we could say that, the, the, that an odd number is odd because what at F is required to make some F nut, for something to have Fness, the thing that's added to it must be F, and therefore we could say that an odd number, if one was odd, we could say that now. That's not the route I assume that, that the scholarly community is taking. It's followed so Stobaeus, 
which is saying that when you take an odd number and you split it, that there's one left over. But the problem with this claim, it seems to me, is that if a one is left over when you split an odd number, that there are actually five monadas in five. In other words, if the third monad, monas is, uh, is left over when you split it, that there, that there are five, there are a total of five monas, and if there are, then the monas is equally the cause of the even as it is of the odd, since there are four monadas in the four. And that Plato intends us to notice this, I think is clear at 104a to b, where he makes the very bizarre claim that odd, he refers to two odd numbers in the singular, which they shouldn't be if they're a collection of monadas, and then actually in the next sentence refers to two even numbers, taduo and tatetera, in the plural, which in theory they're not, if the monas is the cause of oddness by the Stobaeus theory. So it seems to me here is something, it's a text you did not cite in your brilliant analysis of the art. Thank you, thank you. Would you right, like to so, but, well, I, I really have to, to I'm, you're saying there's an incoherence at one point. I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to try and do the mathematics, which I, I don't think I'm capable of anyway. But is this one of his arguments which says, because there's a, here's a passage of Plato which contains an, a mistake or incoherence, therefore Plato intended us to notice that, and therefore Plato never intended it as his own argument. Because that's been done with every single argument in Plato, and he's left with no arguments at all if you apply that principle. Okay, I think I have to apologize, Professor Travertoni and Professor Harper and Professor Brisson, because it's time and we have to go on. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.